Okay, thanks Chris. Um, so this will be a kind of conceptual tutorial for how to embed uh, AI, deep learning, machine learning into imagery construction. So I'm including a few references along the way. I've also got, there are results from my own team, which I can't yet show you. So we're kind of giving you, um, as I say, more of a tutorial conceptual understanding, and I'll give you some examples, uh, but they're not as up to date as I'd like to, because we're submitting work imminently. Um, so here's uh, an overview. Um, I will do the ubiquitous sort of one slide overview of pet reconstruction, but this time showing you the obvious flaws in the method, which is what motivates us to consider machine learning. And uh, there are basically four different categories that I, I've identified for use of machine learning in pet reconstruction. One would be the direct method, where you go from your raw case-based data direct uh, to the reconstruction or sinograms to pet reconstruction. Then there are methods that are post-reconstruction. Um, so I'll show you some examples that Casper's uh, worked on in recent couple of years. Um, and then, and these are the methods that I really favor at the moment where we seek to embed uh, convolutional neural networks or any ANN that you like really inside uh, iterative imagery construction. That way you get to benefit from our system models that we know about already and um, kind of benefit from uh, existing knowledge combined with learning from training data, all inside one construct. Um, and then the last category there, which I'm not very excited about, sorry, but lots of people are, which is using machine learning to just basically do conventional methods far more rapidly. Uh, so that would be an example where you could do these uh, maybe slower kind of map methods and you just train up a, an ANN to map from your MLEM to your Bayesian um, reconstruction quite quickly. Uh, so here's the reason why conventional pet reconstruction is not that great. Uh, we have ground truth parameters, which I'll call T. Sorry for the change of notation. I hope you can stay with it. You should be able to make sense as I go along, make sense of it. Um, we're obviously giving off back-to-back -back photon pairs from that ground truth dis distribution, and we're getting measured data M, like we saw in the previous, previous lecture. And then, uh, now I'm calling it X rather than theta, we're trying to estimate uh, object representation parameters, which we don't know, from that noisy data. And we're using our system model that we know about to predict data, compare it with an objective function, plus some log likelihood, um, and then uh, iterate and update the estimate. And so now I'm just saying we're trying to find the, the image X, which when forward modeled, uh, minimizes some distance D between measured data M um, and our, our forward model. So that's just re rephrasing it that way. So that would be the negative of the Poisson log likelihood, for example. Okay, so we know all about that already. And so what are the problems? Well, obviously problem number one is that we're fitting X uh, to noisy data M. And so if we don't regularize, then we have noisy uh, images X, big problem. And so as Chris has just uh, already talked about, and as I've start, I started to talk about as well, <clears throat> what we do then is use priors um, to try and regularize to reduce that noise. But then, as we've also just heard, how do we pick those hyperparameters? So um, that's, that's the problem that hopefully machine learning will seek to sort out problem one and problem two, if you agree that those two are problems. I hope you do. Okay. Okay, so what is the, the, the change of method with machine learning? Well, it's just to do the obvious from a certain point of view, which is to say, well, and obviously this is the caveat of machine learning, you do need to have knowledge of a ground truth or you need to have knowledge of high quality training data. And what we do is to say, given um, a noisy data set, M, I know, for example, via simulation, that it comes from an image that looks like this, which is beautifully uh, well-defined without noise, great edges, and so on. And then we just turn it around and say, well, let's find the mapping that takes us from noisy data M all in one go um, to my ground truth um, distribution. So it's kind of saying, well, let's actually do what we want rather than fit parameters to noisy data, which we don't want to do, and then regularize because it's got problems. So this is just kind of, uh, as I say, aiming at what we would obviously want to do. So now we're trying to find parameters theta for a mapping F that will take us from data set M, M1 to ground truth T1. So now I'm just writing that as uh, uh, theta arguments of that mapping, just minimize that distance. 
Okay, and the point being that uh, we obviously need to consider a whole large number of training pairs to realistically do that. So find that one mapping F parameterized by theta that can look at all the possible different sets of sinogram data that you could ever imagine with all the corresponding ground truth data sets. That's a lot of hard work with simulations, gate, whatever your favorite, favorite simulator is. And then you just uh, do this huge uh, optimization to find that mapping that will, that will take you from noisy data to your ground truth. So that's the basic concept and paradigm shift that we're, we're talking about rather than the conventional approach. And the point is that once you've got that mapping, you can then plug in your newly acquired measured data set M uh, with those estimated parameters for the mapping and get your reconstruction, which will, as I point out here, the benefit is that it will try and map your noisy measured sinogram directly to something like the ground truth. We're actually heading for where we want to go. It will account for noise and it will account for the system matrix according to the quality of your ability to generate ground truth and measured data pairs. Okay, um, so imagine if a linear mapping was sufficient, then we'd wanna be doing something like this, going from a noisy sinogram to that ground truth image. Uh, if it was linear, then we would just have some huge matrix F full of unknowns um, that we're trying to find. And you would just learn that by numerous very large numbers of training pairs. I'll give you an example in a moment, the well-known auto map example from Zhu et al. Um, and then we would say that our mapping is just linear, just uh, the parameters uh, theta hat that uh, minimized those distances between all the different sinograms and all the different ground truths that we had considered. Um, and that's what we would call a, a so-called fully connected layer in an artificial neural network. It's just the matrix, okay? So that is what, uh, as I say, Zhu et al. did in their famous uh, Nature paper 2018, where they trained it uh, basically for MR reconstruction, but then did sort of example PET reconstruction right at the end. And so I've just shown the PET sinogram and their output image. Not particularly impressive. I'm sure we could do much better than that. But the point is that they used indeed a fully connected layer first up which would be doing what for fully sampled uh, case based data? We all know that it would basically be doing something like an inverse Fourier transform, which is what they were learning. The reason I got three fully connected layers is a little bit misleading. One of them is just uh, reformatting their data into a long vector, which we've done implicitly in our earlier talks. Um, and then after it's kind of learning something like the inverse Fourier transform is then reformatting that vector uh, back into an M by N image. Um, so, Really, one of the early papers in this area was, was trying to get that linear mapping, but then they bolted on some convolutional uh, layers as well, which I'll talk about briefly to try and identify what they're doing. But that's effectively a nice way of denoising your data, trying to give it a sparse representation. Okay. So on that note, we will now take a closer look at CNNs and um, also uh, uh, just by also considering a very simple case of just one convolution before then going on to multiple convolutions in CNNs. Um, any questions so far before we kind of zoom in on that? Yes? We have to do this for every different scatter. Uh, yeah, obviously, because you're implicitly learning the system matrix. Yeah. yeah. So, but the point is their network worked for whether it was MR data or it also worked for, for simulated PET data as well. Yeah. But then, but then I guess to answer it more fully, if you had a large enough network, then you could train, oh, that would be very interesting. You could do one network that do, could do MR reconstruction, PET reconstruction, as long as you've got all of them in the training data. And it would, like, it would recognize, oh, this is case space, so I'm gonna to go to an MR image. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> Anything else? Otherwise I'll go on to, this is a nice uh, educational example for uh, really understanding what we're doing in machine learning, uh, that of convolution. So now my noisy data is just gonna be something like, say from, uh, you know, just like, imagine that's like auto radiography, no major inverse problem. We're just trying to denoise an image to get back to the ground truth. Um, and we're gonna do that with, a, with one convolution. So in other words, find some convolution kernel uh, kappa parameterized by values theta that will just de uh, decide 
I'll just give you the weights of the convolution kernel. Find the best kernel that takes you from that noisy image to the ground truth. Obviously, we won't be able to hit it uh, exactly, but we hope to be able to find uh, a non-trivial kernel that could do that. Um, and I, I just really mentioned this example because I hope it's quite straightforward to understand. You could all uh, conceive of the idea if you've got noisy uh, images, which you could easily generate um, from ground truth images, whether using ImageNet, whether using MR images, whether using example pet images, you could make them more noisy and then uh, so give you all the training data you could ever imagine and then just find that one kernel that would best denoise using exactly the same principle as what I showed earlier for the direct uh, reconstruction approach. So that's just to first motivate that and then show that actually it does work even in MATLAB. So no need for TensorFlow or PyTorch, although we are using those as well. Um, but this was done in MATLAB where we just looked at mapping a noisy image M to a true image T. Maybe I should just show this first row first of all. And the trained kernel obviously is relatively broad and you can see it does a fairly reasonable job of denoising the image. Um, but then should be no surprise that with a less noisy image, the trained kernel is more narrow because it doesn't have to do as much smoothing. OK, so just by tr providing training data, it's implicitly learning the kind of hyperparameters that are necessary for that simple case. OK, that's good. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, it seems uh, quite easy that if you take a true image and you use a your kernel, yeah. you'll end up with a noisy image, would it not be? Could you not do the inverse? I mean, if you took your noisy image, then you use the inverse of your kernel to then end up with your true image, would that not be a better comparison? I mean, on the right hand side, you end up with a, a noisy image, right? Uh, yeah, but it's, it's less oh, noisy. Sorry. So what, what we did here was train up a, a kernel, uh, kappa, and we found the parameters theta hat, yeah, sorry. Yeah. such that when you convolve that, sorry, the slide's not as clear as No, no, it's fine, yeah. fine, fine. Yeah, okay, so you just yeah. denoise uh, that one to get yeah, closer sorry. to that, yeah, okay. And obviously this is only one kernel, it's purely linear, and obviously there's only so much we can do. But this would be an example of what I'd call safe machine learning. So no one's really going to complain about this. Some of the more advanced non-linear networks could be a bit risky, the generative adversarial networks and so on. But this is pretty much uh, risk-free, I would argue. OK. Uh, but now just to look at what convolution can do, especially if you now introduce some non-linearities with activations and thresholds and so on. So thanks, Casper, for this slide. I don't know if he's, no, he's actually left. OK, fine. Um, so what you do here is you could uh, I understand the concept of designing kernels, which when you convolve with some image will give you, uh, and when thresholded, will give you information such as uh, edges. Um, if you designed another kernel, uh, that could give you vertical edges. All we're doing is convolving that kernel with an image uh, getting the result and then thresholding to just get the key features that we're interested in, eliminate all the negatives. Um, and for example, we could also do the same thing to pick out uh, a tumor from that uh, image. We just convolve with that tumor object. We've got some blurred image there, but if we threshold, then we can pretty much pin spot, identify exactly where that uh, tumor is. So you've got to understand here that convolution in combination with something as simplistic as thresholding can dig out all kinds of features. Casper's back, great, okay. I gave you your acknowledgement in your absence. <laughs> um, and so this is an example of say, what, what's going on in a convolu convolutional layer, um, you know, in TensorFlow, Keras, whatever you're using. Um, especially if you build in activations as well. It shows that if you specify three kernels with one input channel, then you'll get three feature maps out the other side. Um, and then the activation, as I say, will, will remove, uh, can remove parts that you're not, not interested in, in this nonlinear way. Okay, so that's a convolutional layer. And so the thresholding would instead be called a bias. And um, that last stage there, as I say, would be called, um, so we have bias and activation to do the job of thresholding, which of course can be great also for removing noise. Okay, so uh, just quickly show you some examples of that, just in that first category of post-reconstruction denoising. I'll go through this quite quickly because time is against us. But just to state the obvious that you can take a regular quality data uh, and then look at reduced quality data by removing a lot of the counts, then you find 
uh, a convolutional neural network where you do multiple convolutional layers to find the way of going from low dose reconstructions to full dose reconstructions. So this is uh, work that dates back uh, a year or two now. Uh, that's an example of the network that was used by Casper for doing this. And you, uh, he just has, in fact, in his case, he had four input images, did multiple convolutional kernels to get multiple feature maps, does the, the activation, does the same process again. You train it up um, and you can end up with some quite uh, promising results. So he was training those four to hit that target there and you get quite a, a reasonably good denoised image on the right hand side. So perhaps this is not too surprising. Um, the point is you can get down to uh, quite low uh, quality data sets and improve them significantly, just to show it also works for real data. Because uh, you can train on real data because it's easily to downgrade your data. So instead of uh, having the task being a higher quality reference, what you do instead is consider a lower quality version of what you already have. And that's one way of obviously having the high quality reference uh, that you need in, in training. Okay. So uh, I want to move on to the more exciting stuff there, just to recap where we're up to now. So I've briefly touched on direct methods as covered by Zhu et al in nature, as, a, as an example of them anyway. And the point is you're ignoring knowledge of your system. You're ignoring all our previous lectures today, all of that's discarded effectively. Um, and you also need large amounts of training data. But, um, I'm sorry, just to also comment that post-reconstruction CNNs, the problem with that is it's post-reconstruction and you've lost access to the raw data, you no longer respect it. You've kind of damaged your data, you could argue. And so there's got to be a better way. And so that's what I'm mentioning in the middle of the slide here. So it would be better really to combine all of these concepts together. Yes? What do you mean with large amounts of data? Uh, so large amounts, so Zoo et al, I think they were in the tens of thousands of training pairs. Uh, sorry, please feel free to check. Let's just say multiple thousands of training pairs needed. That's a lot. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it would be better to try and get the benefit of that kind of paradigm shift of fitting to what we want and not fitting to what we don't want to noisy data, um, whilst also benefiting from our knowledge of the system matrix uh, and using the raw data rather than post reconstruction. Um, and that is what these so-called unrolled iterative methods are seeking to do. So I've, th these are the key references I'm mentioning. I, I haven't uh, taken, I haven't been presumptuous enough as to take from their papers and paste into my presentation. So I leave it for you to go and look at the kind of results that they're getting. I'll show you one simple example from my own team. But you've got, for example, uh, Fessler's group with Honky Lim presented some, his slides are available online. You can go and dig them up using BCDNet for low count PET if you want to see what these methods can do. Um, and then Gong has been doing a lot of work and um, very recently uh, in the SPI, SPI proceedings he's published on EMNet. But I'll basically take you through the principles of these methods. Okay, um, so first, uh, sorry, another recap, you know this already. Uh, this is regular MLEM reconstruction which you saw earlier. And it all works beautifully if we have noise free data. So look at that, iteration 32 is looking great. If we kept going with noise-free data, we'd end up hopefully with a, a, an excellent image. But as we know, we don't have noise-free data. Um, I'm getting the same artifact that Chris had there with the white bars. Um, and so this is where we're now gonna embed the machine learning inside iterative reconstruction. Um, so last time I showed this slide, I said we need to reduce noise, use regularization. In other words, throw in arbitrary prior information about edges and smoothness and so on. Now I'm saying need to reduce noise, therefore use machine learning. That's, that's a key change. Okay, so it would look, this is this just a very introductory uh, slide. I'll go into more specifics in a moment, but it would look something like this. Imagine we're at iteration 32. And, and imagine also that we had access to high quality data, which we could have if we simulated uh, data or if we did high stats and so on. And then we have on the right hand side, our noisy reconstruction. The basic concept is to say, well, from that iteration 32, can we use an ANN such as CNN to map from that low quality uh, iterate to our high quality reference at the same iteration number. That's the starting point. Let's um, work through two examples now. 
So the first example is an intuitive one, which is pretty much related to methods such as by Honky Lim, as presented uh, in Sydney at the Metal Imaging Conference at the end of last year, and also uh, similar to what Gong is now doing uh, with his EM net. But I'll take you through the intuitive example, then I'll show you the kind of approach that these, these others are using. So this is the intuitive approach to how you put a CNN inside MLEM. We've got our noisy data on the left side. Uh, we run it through an MLEM update. Remember the MLEM update is going to need the current image, iteration K. It's going to need your measured data, and it will provide a noisy update of your image. Now, crucially, on the right-hand side, we're claiming we have access to a high-quality data set. We plug that in the MLEM update. We've also got the same image, current image estimate going in, and that will provide, of course, a nice high-quality update. So what we can do is say, well, okay, at iteration K, let's train up a neural network that's going to get me from my bad image to my great image. Do, do a denoiser for that iteration. And once I've done that, save off that denoiser at iteration K. And then, and, but the point is that when we later on need to use this only on noisy data, we don't need the high quality reference because we would have saved off the CNN. That's the key point. Now, we could either use that image as is that comes out of the CNN, or we could fuse it together in a, in a kind of De Piero type fusion update. I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. Um, and then end up with an updated image and then go on to the next iteration. So do you see the, the basic concept of how we get these denoises embedded inside iterative reconstruction? So one of my students uh, did do that, but just to actually point out how it's used, and then I'll give the example. Um, so at the end, we have a CNN for every iteration, and then we can use it on unknown noisy data as follows. Now, I just have measured data, the current estimate, I do my update, I plug it into my pre-trained CNN for that iteration, don't need the high quality reference, so that's provide the regularized update, or rather the regularized image, which I plug into my map EM type update and get uh, the next iteration and so on without the high quality reference now. So one of my students did try this out and you can see it's actually very promising indeed. So on the left hand side, uh, we have what is not a brilliant high quality ground truth, but that was the ground truth for the uh, simulated data that he generated. If you do a regular post-smoothed MLEM, you get a result in the middle. If you design your own CNN, he chose this one here at the bottom. Of course, that's an open question as to how complicated we make these CNNs. He's got, a, he's got three convolutional layers and then a final uh, convolutional sum layer at the end with just a single point kernel to combine all those feature maps together into one single output. And you can see that he gets quite a pleasing result for the uh, iterative uh, CNN approach. Not perfect, obviously you're gonna be liable to noise in your data, but you can see that that image on the right is obviously dramatically better than the conventional post-smoothed uh, MLEM. But that's a kind of relatively intuitive approach to, to how you embed them. Um, the more rigorous approach that is now... Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Um, one slide back. Another one? No, this, 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 this one. one. Yeah. So, is there even any useful pathological information in the one in the middle? Oh, are you because challenging you conventional pet pet reconstruction? <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay with that. I'm used to having the other challenge. Is there anything useful in the. No, yeah. I, so, I don't know. I'm not a doctor. So, I can't, I can't really say what's in the image. But. Uh, it's a brain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, he, he obviously chose quite low statistical quality data here in this instance, and um, maybe you're not so familiar with pet reconstructions, I don't know, but they're typically quite low quality, as mm -hmm. has been pointed out in earlier talks. Yes. And so the image in the middle there is not a million miles away from what one might see. In other words, you can well imagine a low stats PET scan giving something like that, say for some dynamic frame in a, in a dynamic acquisition. Okay, but the thing is, because there's always this discussion that once you learn something with your neural network, yeah, and then you apply it to something, it might just be smooth over your pathology or whatever you want to see. Yeah, that, that yeah, that that's a possibility. But, but I guess the argument I'm making here, I mean, hopefully by building out from first principles, 
we don't have to jump. I mean, this network is arguably too complicated already. I would argue that you could actually use quite a low complexity CNN. And therefore, what goes on in your CNN is not going to be as high performing, but it's going to be by definition relatively safe. You don't have to jump in the deep end and do a GAN here. We could, and it would look great. Yeah. Uh, it would also be massively potentially misleading as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, uh, could you potentially compare the sinograms or instead of the images? Uh, do you mean compare as in like, to upgrade uh, your sinograms or what, like, what do you mean? Like with the noisy sinogram yeah. and the noise Well, so if you were to do that, it, it's, it's all about specifying what you want. And if I'm understanding you correctly, maybe you're saying if I've got this low low quality pet sinogram and I want this high quality pet sinogram, then of course you could train a, an ANN to do that. Um, CNNs, yeah, yeah. I, I think in brief, I'd say yes. Okay. Yeah, but then you'd have to go and do your reconstruction. Yeah. yeah sure. Yeah. Okay. Other queries before I press on in the last five. I've only got about two or three slides, so don't panic. I've not got another. Okay. Right. Um, so the more robust way of doing it. Just a quick reminder now of what we were doing uh, with my brief slide on the De Piero method, where what we're doing with that recognized robust convergent method is that a given uh, image estimate uh, for iteration K, uh, we're doing an MLEM update, so called EM update. And then what happens by, um, if you follow through with a quadratic prior with weights uh, according to an MR image, whatever your favorite prior is, what that boils down to is doing a regularization or a smoothing of your current uh, image. So that smoothing stage there is massively, or in fact, is totally related to that function u that we've talked about. Okay, so that smooth brackets function u is what's going on in there. It produces a modified smoothed image, which is then fused by that kind of quadratic formulation that I showed in the previous talk to then provide your next uh, EM updates. So that's what conventional safe. Um, map EM reconstruction is doing. And so what we do is say, well, OK, uh, we can train up the smooth, as simple as that. And that would be effectively training up your function U based on uh, training pairs. Um, so just to show you how that would work. Now, in the training phase, then what we'd have is, again, our high quality data, our low quality data. We do our conventional MLEM update. On the right hand side, we do an MLEM update of our high quality data. Now, what we're going to do is train up a CNN to do that smoothing, that denoising based on the function u that we don't know, such that when we get an update, okay, so I've tried to color code it, maybe it's not too clear. The training of that CNN is done such that the output update for the map EM matches the high quality reference. Okay, cool. Um, and that means that once we train that CNN to do that, we just run our De Piero type uh, update with our trained CNN put in. And there, just to point out, there are two key ways of doing this. You could either train up uh, one CNN or an ANN that would be the same for every uh, iteration. That'd be like kind of a recurrent neural network type approach. Or we could do, as I've talked about already, train it up for each and every iteration in a tailored fashion. OK, so a quick comparison uh, before my concluding uh, slide of uh, direct methods versus unrolled uh, iterative methods. Um, maybe it's all fairly obvious, but with the direct method, we're going from maybe up to 1,000 sinograms to a 3D image, whereas with the unrolled methods, the training and the mapping is only going image to image, which is quite crucial because it makes it very tractable, very practical. Um, direct method would need thousands upon thousands of training pairs um, generated by simulation or by downgrading existing data or by doing auto radiography, whatever your method is of getting a ground truth. The one on the right hand side, we still need high quality data. Um, and then we would need to save off the iterations as, as we go, as I showed you in the earlier slides. Um, ANN architecture would be fully connected typically for the direct, or it would be a CNN, or you could use 
uh, GANs, for example, for the embedded approach. Now, crucially, look at the storage size. The reason the Zoo et al. paper works is because he did 128 by 128 2D. Well, we can all do all kinds of fancy stuff on 128 by 128 2D reconstruction. If you want to get into real world reconstruction, I would argue, unless you've got some very fancy shortcuts, we can't really uh, do um, machine learning. Um, but you don't I, need to, sorry, you don't need to store that data. I thought when you're doing the training, you have the images as soon as you've trained it for that. Yeah, then we discard those images and then we're left with a system matrix of about 5,000 terabytes. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Okay, sorry, yeah. So, I mean, if you've got a spare laptop, that'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the black hole thing was what? 5,000 petabytes, wasn't it? So it's out there. We could just recruit that uh, infrastructure. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, PET is better quality than the black hole image, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but that said, I have seen a convolutional uh, encoder decoder approach where you know you do get you can get a more practical size, but of course that's being a bit more restricted. That's where you it's a bit like a unit where you have multiple convolutional layers where you downsample each each um, stage. And then you end up with a feature map that's uh, or rather a whole large list of features of relatively small image size. And then you decode back up to your image. So that would be sinogram crunched down to a feature space and then back out. So I have seen uh, kind of intermediate methods that may be not as severe as the one I'm implying here on the, on the direct uh, column there, 5,000 terabytes. So you could obviously get something a bit more practical, but it's not going to be as general uh, in its capabilities as, as the direct method. Um, Benefits are, if that is a benefit, I don't know, it makes no assumptions about the imaging model and it learns objects and mappings together and so when it's trained it's fast to use. Uh, disadvantage, lots of training data, uh, you, you ignore all that knowledge of the physics, uh, it's not practical for 3D arguably and uh, also you're very limited by the objects that you used in your training data of course and that can pose risk. If you've only trained on healthy brains, your network will always give you a beautifully healthy brain every scan that you do. Um, then on the right hand side, uh, obvious advantage is really the size is very manageable and it's relatively low risk. I'm just saying you don't have to go all out there with highly complex CNNs. I'm not talking, so in other words, you can have CNNs where you throw noise at them and you get brilliant results at the other side. I wouldn't uh, suggest that as a good uh, approach for what we're doing in pet reconstruction. Um, yeah. I have a question. Were you using, in fact, also severe pathological cases to train the network or relatively? Yeah, no. So we, as uh, in terms of speaking for my own team, we're still in the early stages. We have, we're, we're using simulated data for, for healthy brains at the moment. But your question is spot on. Um, to what level do you include pathological cases? And, and I, would, I would therefore argue exactly on this point here, keep complexity low. In other words, um, don't risk having your your reconstruction generate this stunning high resolution image with MR informed information and a beautiful tumor that doesn't actually exist in the front of the temporal lobe or whatever it is. You know, you just don't want that to happen. So keep yeah. it safe. Because with us from our yeah. experiences, our images are like bad images are not the exception. They are the rule. <laughs> so you have to start from very, very inter inter-image different, like with great differences between the brains. Uh, so training them with yeah. non-severe yeah. cases, you risk that it works only in beautiful brains, as you said. But yeah, yeah but, but I, I would argue all the way to the other end of the spectrum, which is um, you could just train up a bit like what I showed with the convolution kernel. You could train up the optimum convolution kernel for your typical data sets, and that's not going to be adding or removing pathology. It's going to be just safely doing a basic level of denoising to your data. That's one end of the spectrum, if you agree. The other end is, as we've been talking about. OK, this is my last slide. Um, so in summary, conventional reconstruction uh, is fitting your parameters to noisy data. That gives noisy parameters. Therefore, we use conventional regularization with mysterious hyperparameters that we don't know how to choose. So those are two key issues with conventional reconstruction. Machine learning rushes to the rescue with a new paradigm. It says, let's map the noisy data to what we actually want, which would be the ground truth for a high quality reference. And I actually said at the start, there are four main approaches. I've listed the three ones that are actually interesting because approach four was just speed up conventional methods. 
Um, the key three methods are direct, CNNs for post-processing, and then the one that I think is obviously really taking off at the moment with EMNet by Gong, Honky Lim's work was the embedding uh, architectures like CNNs into the reconstruction process as I've illustrated. Thank you. <laughs> Any further questions for Andrew? Or... That's good. Really good. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting at the beginning you said that you're not a fan of using um, uh, machine learning to just make the uh, current reconstruction methods faster. Yeah. Uh, your very last point is sort of using them in the um, embedding and reconstruction, but the reconstruction method, but that's that's where you're you're making it better. It's not making yes. it better. It's not just making that, it faster. That's just a personal things. expression saying that I, I'm interested in machine learning methods for just pushing the envelope a bit in terms of current performance. That's what I was trying not to say. Not aiming for the same level. Just not asking for the same performance quality, but just faster. Sure. Okay. Yeah.